join me in welcoming Ken Griesbach. All right, well, thanks for inviting me back once again. Uh, I guess this is all on. Uh, civil religion, how the state co-ops God and beguiles Christians. Um, I'm going to change this title at the very end. Uh, it, it has some, some faults with it. it. It suggests that we are the victims, and in some cases we are, but I'm going to show some different angles here of how, in many ways, uh, we are actually feeding the, uh, a system that is actually a false religion. Uh, the term civil religion, I submit to you, um, is something that is contrary to biblical Christianity, and anything, and I mean anything, can turn to a false religion. With that said, uh, let me ask you this question, rhetorical question, don't answer it out loud. Does God need America? And I believe that's very important. I'll answer that question for you at the very end. <laughs> Glad to hear that, no. <laughs> uh, but so often when we get wrapped up or worked up during this time of year, or other certain uh, patriotic events, we begin to thinking, God really does need us. And this picture really does accurately depict in some people's mind of how they perceive the United States of America and how God, in a sense, needs us. I'm going to show some grave concerns about that. Also, with, with that said, what I'd like to, to say this is measure everything by the word of, word of God. The folks in my church, they know this is very important, Acts 17.11, uh, speaking of the, the believers in Thessalonica, and they, these were more noble than those in Thessalonica, and that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether these things were so. My challenge is this, measure everything, and I mean everything, by the word of God. Now, of course, we're going to be talking about American historical events and persons and personalities from the past and even of, of the modern times, Sure, they're not recorded in the Bible, but we must measure everything by the standard of the Word of God. Let me say this, and I'm not going to preach at you too terribly much, but if this book isn't true, then nothing in this world is true. Just mark that down. It's very important for us to, to recognize that and understand that. Um, so with that said, at what point does a nation become idolatrous? I have two pictures up here. One is of, of uh, the temple in Jerusalem an artist's depiction of what Solomon's temple may have looked like. And that's very important for us because uh, Jeremiah raises a question. Hath a nation changed their gods, lowercase g, which are yet no gods? And that's very important because Jeremiah, if you know anything about Jeremiah, he's preaching to a people who are not listening to the truth of God's word. They're very much steeped in paganism as this um, uh, relic that was discovered, a... a, uh, a um, cylinder depicting sacrificing children to the god Molech. This was going on simultaneously while they're worshiping in the temple and in the valley of Hinnom they're likewise worshiping Molech. Jeremiah uh, for 40 years he will preach to the people, hey you have um, you're worshiping in the groves, you have images in the high places, you ought not be doing that. He's pointing out their sin again and again and again. All at the same time their perception is, but we're God's people. We have Jerusalem. We have the temple. We have the sacrifices. We have the priests. We have the prophets. God's not going to take us. As a matter of fact, God took Israel, the, the northern kingdom of, of, of Israel. Uh, Judah was the only one that was left now. So since the northern kingdom was gone, and God made a promise to the covenant people, and he did, then God has to keep us. And strangely enough, in our mindset, we are developing the same kind of, mind, uh, same kind of thinking, that God has to keep us. And I submit to you the answer is no, he doesn't. And, and just as eventually Jeremiah, his prophecies would be fulfilled, and he did not want them to be fulfilled. He wanted the people to be spared. But God kept his word. He could not mix holiness with unholiness, which the people were in fact doing. And so with that said, bring it up to speed to our modern times, anything idolatrous here? Now anything can be an idol. Uh, we worship the almighty dollar in many cases. Oftentimes we worship our, our military strength or the great sheer power that we have or the history of, of our capital building. Even our churches we worship and saying, since we have so many churches in America and so many Christians in America, God cannot judge us. God needs us. But I'm going to show things a little bit differently. Well, I'll start out not terribly controversial for this group. Uh, <laughs> 
Nancy Pelosi, uh, by the way, is, is, a, is a Catholic. I'm not sure if the Catholics really accept her, but she is. Um, and she's speaking at a, a Catholic conference in Washington, D.C. This is around 2003, I think. And she was asked a question about her beliefs. And she says this, my favorite word, um, that is really easy. My favorite word is the word, is the word. And that is everything. It says it all for us. And you know the biblical reference, you know the gospel reference of the word. Now, if you think that sounds choppy, you ought to listen to it on YouTube. It sounds terrible. But anyway, uh, she goes on to build the case that the word became flesh, and she's making reference here to John chapter 1, how the word became flesh, speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, Barack Obama, he was asked at a backyard town hall meeting in Albuquerque, New Mexico, about his beliefs, about his faith. And he says, I'm a Christian by choice. Uh, and he talks about how his family, that they weren't Christian, uh, that they weren't real religious, didn't go to church. His mom was very spiritually minded, he would say. Um, but, and she didn't raise him in church. But he made a choice to be a Christian. Wow, that's impressive. Now, how many of you are buying it? Barack Obama, Nancy Pelosi's defender of the faith, uh, 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 defenders of those uh, uh, things that are everything good, moral, and virtuous. You're buying it? No. No. <laughs> Now, is it because you have a discerning spirit from the Word of God, or is it because you have political bias? Don't answer that. <laughs> I got my own heckling crowd. <laughs> Oftentimes, we, we are suspect of people on the left, and rightly so. But as David already alluded to, when people on the right say things, they like, Goes revised. Interestingly enough, if you're listening, people on the left oftentimes call the people on the right when they misapply spiritual matters, and we do the same to the people on the left. But we, we fail to catch it when it's our own guy. Whether it's a politician, or whether it's a church leader, or whoever it may be. I'm going to stir the pot here a little bit this morning. Here's uh, David Barton quoting John Adams. And uh, David, he's very famous for quoting this particular excerpt from, from John Adams. This is a, a letter, a private letter between John Adams and Benjamin Rush. And, and Barton will put on his white gloves, and you pull out a, a sample of this letter that's, you know, in, in the plastic wrapper, and he'll walk around the room and you'll say this, there is no authority, civil or religious, there can be no legitimate government, but what is administered by the Holy Ghost. That sounds great. And he goes on to build a case that, that John Adams was a devout Christian. He believed in the Trinity and the Holy Spirit of God and so on and so forth. What he fails to share you is the context. From that same letter, by the way, and I'm not sure how it survived, but, but Adams asked Benjamin Rush to burn the letter when he's done reading it. I, I don't know why it survived. And he says this also in the letter. All this is all artifice and cunning in the secret original of the heart. Yet they believe it so sincerely that they will lay it on their lives under the axe or the fiery faggot for it. Alas, poor, weak, ignorant, dupe, human nature. My friends, what he's doing, and this isn't the only case where Adam does this, he is mocking those who believe in the Holy Spirit of God. Now, I know we don't like to hear that in this crowd, but that's what he's doing. I'm saying this. I don't need the founding fathers to be Christian for me to be a Christian. Now, I think some, they definitely were influenced by Christianity. There's no question about it. But it's dangerous for us when we been, begin handpicking a little quote here to build civil religion. And I find that to be incredibly, incredibly dangerous. All right, Solomon, wisest man who ever lived. Uh, he asked, we commonly say for wisdom, he asked for a discerning heart. He, we're drawing on the word Shema in the Hebrew. Are you listening? And I want, again, want to reiterate, are you listening? Are you listening to the right? Are you listening to the left? Are you listening primarily to the word of God and measuring everything by that? Extremely important for us to stop and consider. Having discernment, not just on political or ethnical or national bias, but listening in, in sincerity to the word of God and then making our conclusions from there. David already, he stole my thunder. Uh, civil religion use it, utilizing flattery. And in a 2003 um, State of the Union address, as he's pushing for his faith-based initiative, he did just this. Yet there is power, wonder-working power, not in the blood of the Lamb, but in the goodness and idealism and faith of the American people. That's a problem. That's a major problem. And for those of you who are familiar with my views on the faith-based initiative, I'm very much against it. Very much against it. And, and uh, 
Actually, when it first happened, I was on staff at a church uh, down in Florida at the time, and I was preaching against it back then already, uh, as soon as I, I saw this, because this is a very, very dangerous thing that's mixing things that ought not be mixed, and we're blindly taking on a false religion. How, uh, how can you tell a, a counterfeit from the real thing? Sometimes it's very difficult. Um, if I, somebody gave me a $20 bill, I would not know what the counterfeit, I wouldn't know what's counterfeit. I would go to um, Walmart and they would put their magic marker on it or the bank and they would, they would check it and say, oh, that's counterfeit money. I wouldn't know. And, and so, so it's very important for us to see here that, that Christianity is being counterfeited in various ways. We need to make sure we measure everything by the word of God once again. Okay, so adherence of civil religion. What is civil religion? And, and what do they hold to? And, and what do they believe? And I'm going to challenge you on some things. And I'll admit here, this very first point is one that I have regurgitated and I have believed. And I am now saying, whoa, what was I thinking back there? And, and so here, an adherent of, a, of a civil religion believes that the nation's identity is that of a chosen people uniquely used of God. Yes, America is, is, a, is a different nation. There's no question. Sadly, as many of you know, as the concerns that we see here, are, we're no longer nearly as different as, as we used to be. Uh, we're becoming much like the rest of the world. But that does not necessarily mean that we are a covenant people chosen by God. Yes, God has used America. There's no question. I'm not denying any of that. Here's another point of civil religion. Their people are inherently good and spiritually minded. They believe their people are they're good just because of who they are. I'm going to address that concern as well. They also would believe in an ecumenical faith, uh, that the ecumenical faith will, will promote good and virtue in society. That one's a little uh, tricky. Um, I'm going to explain that. Uh, what does ecumenical mean? Some of you may not know. That's okay. Um, but in a very, very broad sense, we'll see in our nation that this is, in fact, being utilized. And then fourthly, uh, uh, adherents of a civil religion believe that their religious vitality, coupled with military might, will free the world of evil. What I'm going to do now, in reverse order, I'm going to take these point by point and elaborate on them just a little bit. Okay, so religious vitality with military might brings about a free world. And we can see from our own perception of, of current events in history that our nation has been attempting to do this in various ways. And I will say with good intentions, at least some of the folks. But we could uh, look at World War I, we could look at the Cold War, we could look at the modern uh, war on terror, and there is a religious sentiment, a spiritual sentiment on our side, saying why we're involved in this, why we were involved in that, and so on and so forth. Uh, World War I, and I'm not going to get into the details of World War I, uh, but part of the rationale is we need to free the world of autocracy. Uh, the world is becoming more enlightened. Let's bring in democracy. We can't have this autocratic regime in Germany uh, doing their own thing. And uh, how the U.S. got involved in that, you know, I'm going to present some information on that, uh, but from a very interesting perspective. Uh, the Cold War. Obviously, uh, as Ronald Reagan would say, the Soviet Union was an evil empire, and, and Russia is a very dark, was a very dark country, maybe still is. Um, and, and it's sad to see how, how the people were controlled in that way. And so there was a, a sort of religious sentiment on, on our part. How can we bring about freedom? And, of course, the war on terror. Definitely we are seeing uh, uh, religious exchanges uh, uh, in various ways. And so here we are, we do have the most powerful military in the world, and we do have a bit of a religious fervor, uh, and so we are the ones to bring about a better world and a free world. True or false? Again, don't answer it. <laughs> uh, a Christian nation is the only nation that ever ought to go to war. This particular quote uh, came from a member of the clergy back during the time of World War I, the Great War, the war to end all wars. And what was very interesting is, is that, as, as you may know, typically speaking across the board, Americans are very slow about engaging in the Great War. And we did enter it later. Uh, it's been almost 100 years ago now from the end of it. And, and strangely enough, Liberal clergy, and by liberal clergy, I mean uh, the, the higher critics, the German rationalists, which is very strange, and I'm not going to get into that. But they were, they were the ones who were saying, hey, this is an opportunity here to bring about a new age and understanding of spirituality. And we need to make sure that our side is on the winning side. 
And so articles were written, newspaper stories, journal, uh, in various Christian journals. Um, n n numerous members of the liberal clergy, interestingly enough, were saying things such as this. Why is it that only a Christian nation should ever go to war? The rationale was this, because only a Christian nation would know how to properly use the power that God has given them. Does that sound a little hubristic? Yeah, but that was the rationale. Also, along with this, came a, a messianic meaning behind the United States of America. Another member of the clergy said this, those who are truly Christian are anxious to have the United States become the savior to impoverished, distracted, disrupted, groaning Europe after the war is over. And I could show you some much stronger quotes than this, where, where various uh, liberal theologians were equating the blood of soldiers spilt on the European soil to that of the blood of Christ on Calvary. Say, so, whoa, this has gone way too far. And yet, sadly, at that time, many folks did not pick up on this. What's the biblical answer? I'm leaning on Jeremiah fairly heavily today. Um, uh, Jeremiah said this, Thus saith the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man, and maketh flesh his arm, and whose heart departeth from the Lord. Jeremiah was probably the most uh, political of all the prophets. He was always getting in trouble. Uh, and he was also probably one of the most spiritual men. I know that sounds a little, a little unusual saying that, but he was a man who was very much in tune with the heart of God and wanted to do what was right. But sadly, his people were not. The arm of the flesh will fail you. It's important for us to trust in the Lord, not to trust in horses, but to trust in the Lord. Second point, uh, ecumenical faith promotes public virtue. We see this broad spectrum across um, uh, political lines of our various political leaders having just this common ecumenical faith, uh, especially since um, the World Trade Center disaster and, and the various memorial services that have been held annually since then, broad spectrum interfaith meetings from all, all denominations of Christianity to um, Jewish to Muslim to e Eastern followers of Eastern religion and so on and so forth. And this picture, uh, you can't see it real well, but we see a representation. This particular shot, I believe, is from Kansas City, one particular such meeting. And this, this, these national prayer meetings, even the national prayer meetings, I know it's been kind of controversial here lately, uh, but even at those meetings, they're very general, using God in a very generic way, not specifically pointing to the Lord Jesus Christ most of the time. This is good ecumenical faith because all we're really after is people who behave themselves. And so goes the thinking. It causes lots of problems. Here's another one. Maybe we don't see that maybe your pastor um, doesn't participate in ecumenical gatherings such as this one that I just described here, which I submit to you is a good thing if he doesn't. Uh, but how about this? During key times of the year, during patriotic holidays that we most certainly make holy days, and we sing praises to the state in our churches, and, and we... Uh, we, we uh, sing praises to the flag, and so on and so forth. I know this sounds a little controversial here. I believe that the American flag is the American Nehushtan. I, I like our flag. But just as the children of Israel were in the wilderness and they murmured against God, and God sent fiery serpents, and Moses told, after the people cried out to God, God told them to make up a brazen image of a serpent, put it on a pole. Jesus, and the very important doctrinal teaching, I'm not going to get into it, but Jesus would reference that in John chapter 3, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. So there's a very important imagery that we see there. But what did the people do in between? During the time of the kings, they ended up worshiping that brazen image, the Hushtan, just a piece of brass. Sadly, I submit to you, even in our churches, we worship the flag... And in a way that's not appropriate, yes, our flag has important significance as a nation, but to worship it, that's something different. If you think I'm too, a little too far-fetched, do this. Give you a test. Um, don't tell anybody you're doing this. But this next Sunday, go to your church, take a Bible, not in the main walkway, but somewhere where it's in sight, and place a Bible on the floor. And sit back with a notepad or a camera and take notes of how people respond to a Bible being placed on the floor. The next Sunday, do this. Don't tell anybody what you're doing. Put an American flag on the floor and see how they respond. Explain to me that that's not idolatry. Now, I know that the symbolism there, we don't want a flag to touch the ground because that would suggest that our nation has fallen, and that's not what I'm saying. I'm not a proponent of flag burning here. But there is some blind obeisance to the state that we're really not thinking clearly, and we're walking away from the faith that was once delivered to the saints. 
What does the Bible say? Specifically, what did the Lord Jesus Christ say? Broad is the way that leads to destruction. Many faiths guarantee destruction. But narrow or, or straight is the way that, that leads to life. Narrow is the way. It's only by Jesus Christ. It's not by a broad eclecticism or ecumenism. But proponents of civil religion follow just that. How about this, that America is inherently good and spiritually minded? And certainly we have heard this, and a couple of quick examples that I have up here. Donations. Americans are, are famous for, for their generosity and for their donations. Um, one particular quote that I have, or a statistic that I have, and I'm not a big fan of statistics because it gets so skewed so easily, but apparently in 2001, the numbers were um, private citizens in the United States of America gave $34 billion dollars and aid privately to people around the world. That's impressive. Contrast that at the same time, the U.S. government gave $10 billion. And so, so the, the private, the, the movement of the private citizens, citizens in America is impressive. And, and we should keep that up. I'm, I'm not uh, talking down us for this, but are we depending on that? That's what I'm talking about. Public service, maybe that would be something more of the left of how uh, we think of that, the forced volunteerism <laughs> uh, and government service and, and public service and all those sorts of things. That would be something more of their flavor, but you definitely see how both of these overlap and both sides politically say that American people are good people. I know there's always exceptions to everything, but, but generally speaking, trying to build us up as a good and a spiritually minded, a sensitive people. Can the state make men? No. Also, this particular poem that I have here is also from the time of World War I, and again from a liberal member of the clergy who was trying to justify involvement in World War I. The strength of the state will lavish on more than the making of wealth and the making of war. We are learning at last, though the lesson come late, that the making of man is the task of the state. Now, I have problems with that. I hope you do too. But we are seeing very much on both the right and the left politically that government needs to help us along. That's civil religion. That's civil religion. Where does righteousness come from? It comes from God, not from self. But we are all as an unclean thing, Isaiah would say. And all our righteousnesses, our righteousnesses, are as filthy rags. And we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. What is good? I like the word good. You ever do this? Um, Adolf Hitler, he's, he's the evil man in the world. And he was. As long as I'm not bad as Adolf Hitler, I, I'm okay. And some people sadly do think this. And then uh, I was in, in Russia some years ago, and um, we're talking a, a group of pastors, and there was a Russian pastor there, and naturally we got to talking about World War II and the Nazis and, and everything else, and, and we're talking about all the people that, that Hitler killed, and this Russian pastor in English mumbles under his breath, and he says, at least Hitler didn't kill his own people. And for those of you who know, Stalin actually killed more people than, than, than Hitler. And so Hitler, we categorize him as this bad guy who could do no good. But even Hitler can stand up and say, at least I'm not as bad as Joe Stalin. And Joe Stalin can stand up and say, at least I'm not as bad as Jeffrey Dahmer, because he ate, his, ate the people who killed. And so we play the circle, and Jeffrey Dahmer can say, I'm not as bad as Hitler. The, the, but the Bible says they're all gone out of the way. They're together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Again, civil religion says we're basically good. This last point is a little bit more difficult because it is so deeply ingrained in our thinking. As I admitted to you, it was something that I, in various forms, held to myself for a while, and I no longer do. That America has been specially chosen by God. Again, let me say this. Yes, great missionary endeavors have uh, embarked from our shore. Uh, Bibles have been printed. Uh, preachers, uh, uh, many, many preachers and, and people have come to the Lord as a result of, of works that have been done in American soil. But that's not the same as being specially chosen by God. Yes, God is using us. But in a covenant relationship, that's a stretch. Here's some, some quotes uh, uh, from, from various leaders. Um, actually, these first two are from, from George W. Bush. This is the ideal of America, uh, or this ideal of America is the hope of all mankind. Is America the hope of all mankind? I thought Jesus Christ is. Uh, yet we understand our special calling. And these particular quotes come from one, a, uh, a State of the Union address, and another is from uh, remarks that he made on Ellis Island on the first anniversary of the, of, the, uh, of the terrorist attacks on the World Trade Center. 
And so with that said, we have the city on the hill. That one's a lot of fun. Um, last year, when I spoke on, on the um, Declaration of Independence and the biblical influence, and there is biblical influence in the Declaration of Independence, and the founders were influenced by the Bible, there's no question. Um, but I was talking to so somebody from our church, and I said, I'm going to talk in part about the city on a hill. And immediately, he replied, are you going to talk about Ronald Reagan? <laughs> and Ronald Reagan has used that so marvelously that everybody credits him with that. Now, I know the, the man in our church uh, knew better, but it was just kind of funny how, how powerful that, that imagery stands out to us of, of how Ronald Reagan used that. So I'm going to uh, use that. Ronald Reagan, he, of course, used that numerous times, uh, both before he became president, when he was president, and after his presidency, he had used this metaphor. What did he mean by that? Well, a number of things he meant by that. And summarizing, he, he wanted to see a new civilization. He, was, uh, he wanted to promote democracy uh, around the world. And, of course, you see the, uh, the contest between the Soviet Union and the United States and, and Gorbachev and the Soviet Union finally falling. And, and wow, it looked like great things uh, were happening internationally. He also believed in economic freedom and progress. And, hey, I'm all for that. But that's how he utilized that phrase largely, um, city on a hill, he did not make um, biblical references, to my knowledge, of the Lord Jesus Christ using this quote. Uh, I might be wrong on that. If I'm wrong, I, I stand corrected. But where did Reagan steal that from? This is kind of fun. Uh, he actually stole that metaphor from JFK. <laughs> uh, politically, uh, John F. Kennedy, Kennedy was the first one to actually use that metaphor. And, and just for trivia, um, when he was um, giving his uh, farewell address to the Massachusetts Senate, he used that metaphor, city on a hill. Why exactly he used it there, I'm not sure. He would, in various ways, use it again, just like once or twice. Um, but he, in his mindset, he was emphasizing public service. Again, definitely something from the left. And he also, and whereas Reagan would use that metaphor for um, economic opportunity and progress, Kennedy would use it for government, <laughs> is, is the city on a hill. Again, I think we would have problems with that. But where did he get this from? Where did Kennedy get it from? There was a period of silence where virtually nobody used that metaphor politically in America. Yes, it was preached in pulpits because it's from Matthew chapter 5 and verse 14, and appropriately so. But attaching it to the United States of America, it, really wasn't, it certainly wasn't used in the public sector. It may have been used in some classroom settings. Well, it comes from 1630 with John Winthrop. And John Winthrop was a Puritan. Don't confuse the Puritans with the pilgrims. They're different. And, and, and Winthrop, uh, he's, he's coming along uh, in 1630, comes across to Massachusetts. Keep in mind, John Winthrop never in his life heard of the United States of America. Yes, I know he was in Massachusetts, but he had no concept at all of what the United States of America was or is or ever would be. It, it, it wasn't even a thought to him. Yes, he was looking for freedom. And yes, we do say now that he helped build some of that. But accurately stated, the city on the hill speech, as some commonly call it, actually he just has one little phrase in a six-page uh, writing, and it, the title of it actually is Model of Christian Charity. What was he after? He, was, he desired to keep the Puritan religion pure and to be a reflection to the Anglican Church, which he was still very much a part of, though he recognized the, the corruptions in the Anglican Church, and he's hoping that the Puritans would bring about a good change, biblical uh, adherence in the Anglican Church. That's really what his goal was. Um, he wasn't necessarily thinking political as he used this particular metaphor. I also will say this to reiterate from last year. If America held to John Winthrop's model of government, we would not have religious freedom. Everybody in this room would be Puritans right now. All right, uh, that's what his idealism was. Anyway, um, so that's where he gets from. Bring it up to modern days, uh, the city on the hill metaphor is still very much alive. Uh, good old Sarah Palin, uh, and, and her second book, I believe it is, uh, she devotes a chapter to American exceptionalism. She does something really interesting. Uh, she will uh, reference Ronald Reagan. She'll reference uh, uh, John Winthrop. I have the order wrong here on the slide. And she'll, she'll say how Reagan was referencing Winthrop. And then later in the speech, she'll tie in some of the ideals that JFK had, had on America as well. So in one ball of wax, she combines Ronald Reagan, John Winthrop, and John F. Kennedy all in one fail swoop and basically packs you under the city of the hill. Now, I don't know about you. If Ronald Reagan were here today and JFK were here today, uh, I think I would see a few differences. 
And yet, the idea, basically, and this is how we still get so politically charged, and we check our brains at the door. In other words, we can attach all of this together. It's just that guy in the White House right now. That's where the problem is. But I submit to you the problem is far deeper than that. God needs America. Does God need America? No. Glenn Beck. Um, back in 2012, as you know, Glenn Beck has these various rallies now and again. He had in Washington, D.C. He had one in Jerusalem. In 2012, he had one in, in Cowboy State in Dallas, Texas. It's called Restoring Love. Restoring Love Rally. And he had, it was very professionally done. I, I watched it on the internet live at the time, the, the, the grand finale. It was two or so hours long, I believe. Um, and he had different musicians coming in. And he had different historical relics, and he would talk about that. People would sing and, and all this sort of thing. Had some uh, uh, dramatization and, and, and things like that. And there's one particular song, A City on a Hill. Again, playing on John Winthrop and his song, A City on a Hill, attributing it to America. And then he, would, uh, then he uh, had this dramatization of John Winthrop on, on the Arbella and, and giving his speech and, and talking about how we're a city, we're a city on a hill and, and all this sort of thing, tying all of this in. He also, in the course of the whole event, he's talking about the food drive that they had, how they collected food and sent 11 semi-loads of food to 11 major cities in America. Yes, there is the political idea behind it because, as you know, the concerns, you know, different cities are passing ordinances where you can't have a supersized drink or an extra sweet donut or different things like that. So, so Beck was, was playing on that and said, okay, if that's what they're going to do, we're going to send a food drive to these cities. All right, fine. And eat all the donuts they want. What's he saying here? Americans are inherently good. Civil religion. He, he, he gives the challenge for those of you who are watching this internationally and want to see weakness in America. I challenge you to look here tonight and challenge him that there is strength here. Strength with religious vitality to bring about our free world. Civil religion. Uh, an idea of, of, uh, of God placing his hand upon us uniquely and specially as a covenant people. Civil religion. Our friends, I know politically Mr. Beck has said a lot of things that, that have helped us out. But I want to say this, in no uncertain terms. Um, spiritually, Glenn Beck, in every sense of the word, is a wolf in sheep's clothing. All right? And uh, that could get, become a real messy argument, uh, but he most certainly is. He will say during, at the close of, of the presentation, he'll say, this is the third great awakening. Well, step aside, Jonathan Edwards. Here comes Glenn Beck. I wish it was true, but it's purely politically motivated and a, a push of civil religion. It's not limited to him. Um, here's another one. Um, maybe you've heard of the American Patriot Bible. I'm not a fan of it. I believe it was put together by a Baptist preacher. I'm pretty sure uh, Richard Lee is a Baptist. But anyway, I'm Baptist. Next to John 3.16, he'll have a text box. The editors will have a text box that says, of course, John 3.16, probably the most famous verse in all the Bible, speaking of God's love for the world and sending his son uh, for, for the sins of the world. And he has a quote here from Colin Powell. The United States has sent many of its fine young men and women into great peril to fight for our freedom beyond our borders. How do you put that next to John 3.16? I don't want to make light of those who have, who have died representing this country. All right. But to compare that to what Jesus has done for us, that's civil religion. That's a false religion. Civil religion is pro-social. It is anti-individual. Let me say this. I think, at least in generalizations, everybody here understands this. One thing that does make or has made America different, though we are seeing it change before our very eyes, is the emphasis on the individual. I think all of you, would, I hope all of you see that, the emphasis on the individual. But what is happening here, as the left and the right overlap, both spiritually and politically, we are seeing this big tent social program bringing everybody together one way or another, and that individual who's an agitator, no, we just need to convert him and bring him under this big tent. It's very, very dangerous, and there's problems with that. Civil religion focuses on issues. As you can see here from the example, that, from some of the lists that I have here, that these are issues that are special to the left and to the right, and depending on how you look at it, a counter argument as well. Uh, issues that would be important to us on this side, we would, I think in this room we would be typically pro-traditional marriage, or pro-biblical marriage is a better way of saying it. Uh, we'd be pro-life, and rightly so. Uh, some on the other side, they would... Uh, 
they would look at no fair wages or carbon emissions and, and this sort of thing. Interestingly enough, if you stop and listen to the different arguments, both sides at times do use biblical rationale for their particular issue. Now, wrongly so, perhaps, but they do. What they fail to do, or what they're attempting to do, is just bring everybody together in one big group. If we don't do something about abortion, God's going to judge America. <laughs> and that just may happen. In other words, if you people who are pro-abortion don't straighten up, we're going to suffer because of you. On the other side, they'll say, no, no, no. If we don't do something about our carbon footprints, it's going to be all your fault. We're all going to burn up. We all got to get together socially and agree. Big tent. Confer uh, conform to our side, and that's what it is. What, what's the problem here? We are failing to see uh, the sin issue. We see the social ramifications, and there are many social ramifications, but we're failing to see that sin is a personal offense against God. Let me do this, and just rhetorical again. Even in your church, when was the last time you even heard the word sin? Uh, I, and I can't speak for you, for your church, uh, but we need to hear about sin. And it is a personal offense that a person does, and it's contrary. It is against a holy God. It's very important for us to see. Civil religion doesn't do that because we're all basically good, remember? As I mentioned, a de denial of personal sin. A an early emphasis in America was placed upon the individual. It was not originally that way. It was very much the corporate mindset. And as I mentioned, John Winthrop did have that corporate mindset. Did it all got to come together. In fact, when he would become governor, he would pass uh, laws to make to force people to sign up and be a part in good standing of a Puritan church. Or pay a heavy tax or, or suffer for it in various ways. And there were people who have done that. I've talked about that before in the past. The corporate mindset all come together. But then Jonathan Edwards would come along, and there would be others. He wasn't alone for sure. He would come along, and though he was very much part, initially, of the state church uh, mindset, he would preach his famous sermon, Sinners in the Hand of an Angry God. And though the gospel did not start with Jonathan Edwards, God always has his witness, but at least from a, from a, a more accepted viewpoint in a nation, it began to take root. And of course, eventually freedom to develop. Why? Because now for at least in a broader sense, the individual really was recognized for his worth. And why did the individual recognize? Why was the individual recognized? Because the individual took responsibility for his own sin and turned to a holy God. And therefore, once people were governed by a holy God, then there would be decent citizens in a nation. That's what we need today. We don't need, we don't need more laws to harness us in. Sadly, that is what's happening because we're not controlling ourselves. And yes, the founders do make reference to that as well. But denial of a personal sin. What's the problem? Has the state beguiled Christians? No, we've done it to ourselves. The Bible says, but every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lusts and enticed. As I presented to you um, from various members of the clergy, though we may not agree with them, and even various political figures and, and, and different, different folks who, who in various ways we, we would think alike, but things are happening subtly and we are doing it to ourselves. I'm going to take a little bit of a jump here. I'm going to do a little spin on Saul Alinsky. Saul Alinsky said this, the issue is never the issue. What do you say? The revolution is the issue. Now, he was a very clever man. Sadly, unless something happened that we're not aware of, he's probably in hell at this very moment. Anyway, um, he was part right. The issue is never the issue. Marriage, life, the environment, the economy, education. Oh, yeah, these things are important, and we have our positions on them. But let's look, let's look beyond the distraction. He was right when he said the issue is never the issue. But when he failed to see what the issue really is, the gospel is the issue. It's always been that way. And my friends, I submit to you that even a little bit of counterfeits takes something good and makes it imitation, and that is not pleasing to God. All right. I guess I did okay on time. I left a few minutes for questions. Um, any questions? Yes, sir. 
first, my first comment is that you don't notice a really uh, noticeable erosion of Christianity, especially among our young people. Uh, for example, they don't take the bond of marriage seriously. They don't get married in church. I think it's a big party. You know, they get married up hard for you, you know. And I don't know what led to that. But if that continues, what, what our next generation and the generation after that is not going to take Christianity or Christian seriously. And that's an erosion of our moral values. Yeah, you're right. Part of the problem with the civil religion idea is we are approaching matters legally and we're not approaching them biblically. Uh, Yes, uh, in our church, uh, we believe the Bible, one man, one wife for life. All right. Well, I'm certainly, they get married four or five years later for the divorce. Yes. And with that said, and, and I know this is a very sensitive issue, but how do we handle that in our churches? We're not teaching on it and preaching on it very clearly. Uh, we have become very big tent in that. Instead of addressing sin, okay, we make a new Sunday school class for singles again and again and again. And, and please, I say that very carefully because I have people in our church who, who likewise have gone through that, and I, and I don't mean to rehash that. But we point the fingers over there. They don't understand marriage. Two people of the same gender, are you kidding? But we're not handling it biblically in our churches. The Bible says judgment begins in the house of God. All right. Uh, and, uh, yes, sir. You know, I think one of the problems is probably you can lay it on the end of religion. No one celebrates marriage today. Right. I, I try to get our church to say, let's, in our faith, we wrote our own uh, liturgy. We took a song like, I did it my way, and I did it uh, God's way. So we started off my way, our way, and then God's way. Right. But, that's on deaf ears. I don't care if it's Catholic or Protestant or whatever. We don't celebrate age. Yeah. We, we don't respect our elders age. You're absolutely right. And, 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 so, and we've got all these rock stars and they have to pull them off and they can't even hear the word on their songs. You're right. But that starts at home. And, and I've been to church for running on sin. And that, Jesus came around after he got all that Old Testament stuff. That, that changed himself here. And Jesus said, Follow me. Lay up your life. Right. And then we're still looking at the darkness. So. Yeah. Yeah, we really don't uh, value it. I'm out of time. Let me just close it here with, with this. Um, which hill? And, uh, and look beyond the imagery here. Are you trusting in your nation? Are you trusting in, in the goodness and greatness of America? And there is a lot of good and great things that have happened here. Is that where you are? Is that, is that where your eyes are fixed? Or are you looking beyond the cross to the person of the Lord Jesus Christ? That's really where we are, and that's the dilemma we're in. We have religion. We have a form of godliness, but we're denying the power thereof. I'll, I'll stop there. All right. Thank you very much, Kevin.